faire une, une entorse au, au protocole en, en parlant français pour remercier euh, les organisateurs, Barbara Romanovic et Jan Klinger, de m'avoir invité. And now I'm going to speak English because otherwise I would, uh, I would, I would be politically incorrect. So, um, I, uh, I wish to uh, talk a little bit about tsunami, uh, which is a field that has kept me busy for uh, most of my career. And um, uh, the emphasis I want to give today is, uh, if you have a full screen uh, view, no, full screen mode. Okay, thank you. The emphasis uh, I want to, to, to give today is really to um, explain how uh, tsunamis um, can um, uh, present the Earth as a, a, a system of uh, very significantly different materials, a solid Earth, an ocean, maybe also an atmosphere, uh, which happen to be coupled. And uh, the tsunami residing at the, in the ocean, uh, in that layer which sits between two, two media which are so different from each other um, and from itself, uh, can be a, a way to examine uh, very subtle uh, ways to, to couple what I call eclectic, eclectic media. And uh, without further ado, a tsunami, as you know, is a gravitational oscillation of a mass of water of the ocean following a disturbance of the ocean. You will find it both in French and in English, uh, the word tidal wave or rad marée or flutwelle in German. And uh, of course, this has absolutely nothing to do with tides. Uh, and only in those countries which don't have too many tsunamis do they use the, these words rad marée because they, they, they refer to something which is well known, which is the tide, which comes twice a day. But unfortunately, um, this, uh, this has nothing to do with tides. But in those countries where they do have tsunamis, uh, such as um, uh, maybe in Italy or in the, um, the Spanish-speaking countries or in Marquesan or in Japanese, they, they have a special word. And this is why we use the, the, the word tsunami um, in, uh, which means harbor wave in, in Japanese. Now, tsunamis are generated by earthquakes, landslides, volcanic explosion, bolide impacts, and also by uh, meteorological phenomena. Uh, I've used a different font, not only a different color, but a different point size to emphasize that most tsunamis are generated by earthquakes, even though uh, tsunamis occur in water and earthquakes occur in the, in the solid earth. So that already points out to something that there must be some kind of coupling between the two there that we may learn something from. Landslides are a very tricky issue because, yes, they take place inside the, the oceanic column and therefore they can trigger tsunami, but we don't know too much about them, um, even though they, they can play quite a role in generating uh, tsunamis. Volcanic ex ex eruptions are very tricky because they can take place both uh, in the water column and above the water column. Um, and um, I will, and they, they lead to this business of coupling between the, the atmosphere and uh, the water. Now, of course, bolide impacts, we will all die from one one day, um, you know, like the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Um, they can contribute to, to mega tsunamis, but there is only, to my knowledge, one really very well a documented case, and that's Chicxulub uh, 65 million years ago. So, uh, the classical approach to studying tsunamis is uh, described in this in this um, diagram here. You have uh, you have uh, uh, an equilibrium uh, situation here, and during an earthquake, you push up here a kind of plug at the bottom, and you can think of a generation of a tsunami by saying. Um, I just move the water from the bottom to the top, it creates a hump, and of course the hump is unstable, so the hump uh, flows away, and that's the tsunami wave, and we, if you wait long enough, you end up with um, the, the new uh, equilibrium position uh, for which the, the surface of the sea really hasn't changed because the sea is so large that the, the, the excess water has been spread over it and the, and the average altitude of the sea hasn't changed. Uh, this is a... A, this, is, this has been used and is used every day to simulate tsunamis, but there is something inherently wrong here, which is, to, which is this assumption that, that, the, uh, uh, that the, the water is transported, is transferred to the, to the surface. And uh, this assumption is, is wrong because we all know that it doesn't occur like this, and there are analytical solutions by people like Hamak in the 70s and so on, which, which provide a better description. 
But um, there is a lot of physics here because uh, it's a question of timing. Uh, you move an earthquake wave very, you move a, a dislocation at the bottom of the, of the ocean very quickly, and therefore uh, you do something quickly. When you do something quickly in physics, I was taught many, many years ago, um, actually across the street in, uh, at Le Louis Grand, across the street, I was taught that um, uh, when you do something quickly, you do it irreversibly. And when you do something irreversibly, you spend more energy than if you were doing it reversibly, one step at a time, you know, one of these steps here at a time. And, um, and this excess of energy is what creates the tsunami energy. And I could, uh, if I had more time, uh, I could go through all the derivation, but you have to keep in mind that in the inter-seismic period, uh, we don't have any, any tsunamis, um, when, you, when you deform ever so slightly the, the material at the bottom of the ocean during the inter-seismic uh, period, because you do it so slowly that the system has the time to readjust itself to equilibrium uh, before you, you generate waves. So we have to keep this in mind. A few numbers very quickly for those of you who may not know, tsunamis are things which, uh, uh, which uh, involved very small um, deformations of the ocean. Uh, maybe a few tens of centimeters, uh, this thing which I call Z on the diagram, um, exceptionally one meter uh, during, the, uh, during the Tohoku tsunami. Um, they, uh, but they are spread over enormous distances. Uh, lambda is not typically on the order of the width of the seismic zone, uh, which is 300 kilometers at the most, which means that uh, we're not going to see this on the surface. We cannot see a tsunami. Aha. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, and they propagate, another number to remember is that they propagate um, under the shallow water approximation at a speed which is given by square root of gh, which is about 200 meters per second, or the speed of a jet plane. So this is good news and bad news. Um, it's, uh, it's bad news because they propagate very slowly. If you have crossed the Pacific on, on an airplane, you know it's very long, but it's good news because it can give you a warning. Um, now, this is in deep water. Oh, when you come to, uh, to a, a shoreline, things change. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the depth uh, is reduced, so the, the, the speed is reduced, and therefore uh, the energy has to be kept in some way, and the, the only way is to uh, increase the, the amplitude. And, and this is how, uh, when you consider the interaction with the coastline, you can get these images where you get 32 meters of, of flow depth here um, during the, the Sumatra tsunami. And uh, you, you just run up uh, inland uh, to distances which can be kilometer, kilometers, and therefore uh, uh, you can end up with a lot of destruction. So how do we ad address the problem of trying to model tsunamis? You start with F equals MA. And F equals MA was written by Navier and Stokes here uh, in this form, where uh, the, the force is uh, where you have a full derivative and, um, and the force is, of course, something like the gradient of a pressure plus uh, whatever force you put in there, uh, plus um, the divergence of the stress tensor, which is generated in the fluid. And so you start all kinds of approximations, and I don't have too much time. Uh, if uh, you can neglect the viscosity, you become Newtonian, and Newton at some point was worth one pound in England. Um, and then uh, if you can consider that the, f that the fluid is inviscid, uh, which means that mu equals zero, uh, then uh, you, you become Eulerian, and Euler was, was worth uh, 10 Swiss francs at some point. Um, and um, a very important thing is that since you need a full derivative in fluid mechanics, and that's the big difference between fluid mechanics and solid mechanics, if you need a, fluid, a, fluid, um, a full derivative, um, you introduce nonlinearity because you have this thing which is uh, um, a D, uh, uh, capital D U D T is, is partial D U D T plus U gradient U, and that's a, that's a nonlinear term. And that's a, that's a bit of a problem computationally. And then you can go into the shallow water approximation where you replace this with only a, a variable which is the amplitude at the surface and an average velocity, uh, a horizontal velocity in the layer, which, is, which happens to be a bad constant. So you get to these equations which are reasonably simple, and then you put some kind uh, of uh, boundary conditions, and uh, you end up with, uh, in the shallow water approximation with, with this well-known equation, which is that you have a velocity which is square root of gh, which is undispersed. So everything travels at the same time, which is, of course, only an approximation. So uh, again, you, you, 
uh, you travel at the speed of a, of a jet plane, and because the, the depth of the ocean varies from point to point, you may have uh, a kind of uh, snail's law uh, effect, which means focusing and defocusing. You know, those of you above a certain age here use these devices and know very well about focusing and defocusing. And uh, you end up with these kinds of diagrams. This one we published about 30 years ago with Mark Woods. Uh, and uh, in particular, mid-oceanic ridges can focus uh, tsunamis very efficiently, as was the case uh, here uh, during the Sumatra tsunami. So how do we go uh, through the process of, of making these simulations? We obtain a model of earthquake rupture, so we have a, a seismological model. We compute the static deformation at the ocean bottom, these plugs which go up and down at the ocean bottom. We use them as initial conditions uh, for the vertical surface displacement with zero initial velocity. And when we solve the, 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 um, uh, the uh, hydrodynamic model in the form of the differential equations under the shallow water approximation, and then if we are really smart, we propagate it up uh, and, and uh, model the run up at the receiving shore, uh, you know, step by step on a very short grid. And uh, so to give you an idea of what we do, we go through the uh, equations for the static deformation of the ocean bottom, which, are, which were given by Mancini and Smiley in 1971, um, and uh, uh, in a sense generalized by Okada-san in uh, 1985. And these are reasonably arcane uh, expressions, uh, but you can feed this into a computer, uh, check your, uh, your coding a couple of times, and uh, you produce this kind of, uh, of um, uh, map of a displacement and you use it as the initial condition for your simulations. And the end product of the simulations are things like this. You can have a snapshot at, at, at a given time, um, in this case about three hours after the, the earthquake in Chile. Uh, this is a, a modeling of a 1906 Valparaiso earthquake. Or you can have a map of the maximum amplitudes uh, at any given time in the, in the Pacific Ocean. Now this is done and, and uh, uh, routinely, I must say. However. We go back to this map and we say, come on, uh, you need two things which are completely um, incompatible with each other. The first one is this item number two, compute the static deformation of the ocean bottom. You assume that there is no water on top of it, okay? Well, maybe this is a good assumption, but we, we just assume that there is no water. Uh, and then at number four, you run the hydrodynamic model, assuming <laughs> that the bottom is completely rigid. So negating uh, what you did in, in uh, number two. Well, in the end, it sort of works, which means that the coupling is very, very weak, but um, it, is, it is not very satisfactory. And this is how, in 1980, uh, Stephen Ward came with this absolutely brilliant idea that the tsunamis were actually, could be considered as a special branch of the free oscillations of the Earth. Now, I cannot give you a course of free oscillations, but you all know that the Earth has, has uh, uh, normal modes, uh, one of them is the breathing mode at about 22 minutes, the other one is a so-called football mode, which in French we should call uh, mode rugby, um, at 54 minutes and so on. And it turns out that Steve Wolves introduced the idea that uh, the tsunami is really a, a, a normal mode of the Earth when you give the Earth an additional layer which uh, is, uh, happens to be liquid, and that to put this at the top of the, of the um, layering of the Earth. And um, this works in the following way. Essentially, if you consider a, the classical Rayleigh wave here, uh, a Rayleigh wave ca can be prolonged mathematically into the ocean, and you don't change very much the vertical displacement. Uh, the pressure here was nearly zero, was, was zero if there is no ocean. It becomes nearly zero, and, and a very small uh, um, a component to the eigen uh, function here, and you have a, a horizontal uh, motion as well, which essentially, but not exactly, vanishes at the surface. You transfer this to the case of a tsunami, and what you find is that your uh, vertical displacement, which was supposed to be uh, uh, zero at the bottom, if the bottom is totally rigid, um, is slightly negative. Uh, here I've multiplied the amplitudes by 100 so that you can read them. The, the, the red line is continuous, but I've multiplied it by 100 and is prolonged into the, the Earth. Uh, similarly, the pressure uh, is continuous and decays slowly with depth inside the Earth. And you also have a, a horizontal component, which is nearly constant here in the tsunami, 
uh, is, of course, discontinuous here because you're going from a fluid to a solid body, uh, but you pick up a very slight um, uh, lateral um, horizontal displacement component in the solid. Why is, it, why is all this important? Because in 1970, Freeman Gilbert uh, produced this extremely seminal um, paper in which he, uh, he uh, showed that the excitation of a normal mode of the Earth is proportional uh, to the double scalar product of the uh, moment tensor of the earthquake uh, with the eigen strain of the mode in question. And then you can sum over all the modes and you get all the, si the, the uh, synthetic seismograms uh, you want. And this formula can be immediately adapted to the case of uh, the tsunami mode. You, there is, I mean, it's, um, you don't have to change your codes or anything. You can adapt the formula immediately. And there are some immediate results. The eigenfunction is very small here. So the eigenstrain is going to be very small. And, if, and it means that to excite anything, you need a big earthquake. It's that simple. I mean, it's trivial, uh, but, but it's, worth, um, it's worth repeating. The eigenfunction decays uh, slowly in the solid Earth. You see this red line here from 5 to 200 kilometers, it decays rather slowly. So contrary to um, widely perceived uh, idea, uh, the, the tsunami, the excitation of a tsunami by uh, with the dependence on depth is going to be reasonably small. And then Y3, which is the, the horizontal displacement, is present in the solid earth. So even a strike slip earthquake is going to excite a tsunami. As uh, paradoxical as it may sound, this is, this is correct. So um, that, that shows that the, the, this normal mode approach to tsunamis is incredibly powerful because uh, it, it handles any ocean to solid earth coupling, including sedimentary layers. Uh, you don't have to assume that, that there is no water on top when you compute your, your um, uh, static displacement. You don't have to assume that, that when you compute your propagation of a tsunami, you don't have to assume that the bottom is rigid because it's not. And, um, it works well at higher frequencies outside the shallow water approximation, but the drawback, of course, is that you must assume laterally homogeneous structure. It's very difficult to, to have a normal mode approach where one third of the Earth is a continent. Mm? Okay, and uh, it's a linear theor theory, so it doesn't allow for very large amplitudes. But you can, you can uh, compute um, normal mode synthetics, and you have this beautiful dispersion here, um, and uh, this computation is equivalent to a linear dispersive technique. So uh, now I'm going to say, why, why do I go through all of this? And um, um, how can I, uh, can I address this problem of the coupling of the, of the ocean with, with the Earth? And this came from Rainer Kind in Germany, uh, who in 2005 noticed that he could see, after some filtering, of course, he could see tsunamis recorded on horizontal seismometers in the Indian Ocean. Uh, tsunamis which were on islands in the Indian Ocean um, recorded on horizontal seismometers after, after filtering. And the, the same kind of, of uh, observation was made by uh, Roger Hansen in, um, in, uh, at about the same, the same year. And I, I jumped on this observation, which I found phenomenal, and um, I, I showed that this was actually recorded worldwide and uh, that uh, the higher frequencies were picked up and could be, as I will show, uh, could be quantified and um, that the tsunami could be detected for smaller events. Uh, here is a case, for example, in Hawaii. This is a Sumatra tsunami recorded in Hawaii after it's gone all the way from the Indian Ocean through the Drake Straits here and up the Pacific Ocean. And you can see that once you filter it, between 100 and 10,000 seconds, you have a signal. When you see a signal and you are a seismologist, you say, hey, I want to measure it and to, um, and to quantify it. You can even see it uh, without any filtering on this record in Hope, um, which, um, which is in South Georgia. And uh, in order to quantify it, I use this record at Amsterdam, which is a French island uh, you know, in the middle of the ocean, uh, which, has, which, is, which sits on a very, very small island. And um, uh, the, uh, the, the way to address the problem is, how can we quantify this, this, this thing? Well, first of all, I'm going to use normal mode theory, if not, no other reason, because there is this dispersion, which is so well represented. And then I'm going to make some rather drastic assumptions. I'm going to forget the island. I mean, you have a five kilometer island recording a wave which is supposed to have 300 kilometers of wavelength. You can just shave the island off. 
and, and assume that your seismometer is actually sitting on the bottom of the ocean, uh, of the, um, of the ocean uh, floor and records the, well, and records the, the horizontal motion of the ocean floor, at least the first approximation. And why can I do this? And uh, even though it's, it sounds outrageous, well, the answer justifies the means, right? La fin justifie les moyens. So uh, let's proceed. Uh, you can go and read more of Freeman Gilbert's paper, and you will see that um, a horizontal seismometer doesn't really record uh, only the horizontal acceleration of the Earth, uh, but it also records all kinds of things which have to do with tilt, variation in gravity, all kinds of things like this. Effects which, if you deal with a spherical mode, um, amount to something like under the worst possible situation about 10% of the amplitude. But if you deal with the tsunami waves and you compute all of these things, you find that uh, uh, you can reach an order of magnitude or so. So you you've got to be very careful and use all these corrections. But the, the long story is that, uh, to make a long story short, that what we find is that if we focus at 800 seconds, which is about where the, the amplitude is maximum, we find a moment of 1.710 to the 30th. And uh, you remember that the, the Sumatra was given as 1.15, 10 to the 30th, 1.2 uh, later on, and so on. And, and it means that uh, given the, the kind of approximations we've made, <laughs> that's not bad at all. Uh, so it's acceptable given the extreme nature of the approximation. So actually, for a tsunami, a, a seismometer sitting on an island functions as an OBS at a significant fraction of the cost, of course. So um, we generalized this. Uh, this is the case of Maui, uh, recorded, in, um, recorded in Raoul Island, uh, Picairn, and uh, uh, where you can really do some interesting thing is that um, you can uh, study, for example, the station average um, moment that you compute uh, at various periods, and you can push the periods you know, into uh, the realm of Earth's normal modes are even, are even um, longer, and, and you find that um, you pretty much agree with a CMT moment, uh, which means the Maui earthquake was, had no slowness. And um, uh, that is an additional uh, check on this property that comes from uh, tsunami theory. So, having said this, um, I, I hope I've convinced you that actually the tsunami is prolonged and has part of its eigenfunction, function, parts of energy uh, propagating in the Earth, right? Um, how about uh, up there? Well, up there, we use in all the simulations, uh, we use a free surface boundary condition, you know, with a zero pressure, uh, with a zero density of the air. Well, if, uh, if we had uh, an air of zero density, we would all be dead as animals, you know, because we couldn't breathe. So there is something there. And this was suggested as early as the 1970s by Dick Peltier, among others. Um, and uh, uh, the story uh, is, is the following. Um, the, the, tsunami, uh, amp the, <clears throat> the tsunami amplitude here has to be continuous, uh, but of course, it's the whole phenomenon, the whole, the whole wave, if you wish, will decay exponentially with height. Uh, yes, the energy density of the wave will decay exponentially with height, but you know when you climb a mountain that the density of the atmosphere decays very fast with height and you have trouble breathing at 3,000 meters or, or above. And so uh, it so happens that the, the actual amplitude of the signal may increase with height when you reach these, these, uh, these regions here, uh, which are you know, something like 70 kilometers and up. And um, uh, that leads to, to the fact that the tsunami is also prolonged into the, the atmosphere. And uh, this was um, uh, detected by Artru and Canamori and Philippe Lognonnet and others uh, even before the Sumatra earthquake, and of course verified and quantified uh, by uh, Lou and others, and of course uh, Ninto here uh, in France, uh, who manage uh, by, by measuring the, the total electronic content signal uh, in the ionosphere, which is disturbed by the presence of that oscillation of the, of the ionosphere, which can reach kilometers in, in amplitude, uh, they were able, in a sense, to reconstruct the, the amplitude of the, of the seismic moment. And uh, I'm not going to, I mean, we've, we've all heard about the beautiful things that uh, uh, Ninto and his group and Philippe Lenonet uh, have done, um, and um, I'm just mentioning this for the, the record here. Now, another case which is kind of interesting to give you an idea of the power of this, uh, of this normal mode theory, which allows to, 
uh, measure the, uh, which allows to, to measure the coupling between the water column and the ground, um, uh, the, um, is the case of the, uh, one of the largest uh, bombs that the United States detonated, which was uh, an H-bomb detonated in 1969 uh, on Amshitka Island here. There are a bunch of visionary people in Hawaii at the, at the time, Martin Vitushek and others, they were building uh, the prototype of uh, what has been known as DARTs, which are these sensors on the ocean floor which, which measure a difference in pressure and can catch the passage of a wave. And um, they were in the know of what was going on, and so they deployed one of, his, they deployed one of their guys here um, uh, near Amshitka. And sure enough, they, they caught the tsunami and they published it in some kind of proceedings of a tsunami meeting, which are completely lost in the gray literature, but I found it. I filtered their records, I measured this thing, and um, uh, you know, I, I will get into the details of the competition if you're interested, but I was able to suggest 800 kT uh, based on a back of the envelope calculation of the normal mode excitation uh, of the tsunami by, by an explosion in the earth. And um, you know, the yield was one megaton, so you get 20% of the value uh, from the back of the envelope, and that's satisfactory enough. Um, there are some more subtle, um, there are some more subtle um, uh, coupling uh, stories between the atmosphere and tsunamis, and uh, we all know about the uh, next air delivery service, so you can actually, using UPS or somebody else, uh, you can actually deliver a tsunami by next day air, and this is what happened in Krakatoa in uh, 1883. Now, you all heard about the explosion of Krakatoa in 1883, a wonderful place to visit if you have a chance. Um, and um, there was a catastrophic tsunami which killed 35,000 people in Batavia, which is now Jakarta. And um, um, uh, Satake and, and one of his students um, showed that they could model the tsunami in Batavia using, uh, using the, the um, standard approach. However, this tsunami was reported, recorded well, worldwide. Uh, recorded on tidal gauges. They had tidal gauges. They didn't have seismometers in those days, but they had tidal gauges, and this would seem to contradict the dispersive nature of a short wavelengths um, associated with an explosion like this. You know, the wavelengths are not more than maybe 25, 30 kilometers, and they don't propagate very well. But uh, of course, the uh, press and Hawk Rider showed uh, that the, the tsunami was really an air wave. It was, a, <laughs> was an ancillary phenomenon to an air wave, which was generated by the explosion in the atmosphere, and which propagated at the speed of, of sound, which is 340 uh, meters per second as opposed to 220. So the tsunami actually arrives early. The tsunami crosses continents, which for a tsunami is a little um, uh, difficult to, to interpret. And uh, these guys, which were in the business of uh, measuring various uh, things in the atmosphere at the time, uh, managed to estimate the power of the explosion to 100 and 150 megatons. So, and here are the, the records which they published. So, uh, you can actually deliver a tsunami through the air. That's interesting. Can you see a tsunami? I told you no, because the, oops, <laughs> uh, I told you no, because the, the amplitude is too small and the wavelength is too large. And yet there are some, some stories of people who sit in uh, lighthouses, you know, lighthouse keeper, that's a job which is on the go now, but there were people who spent 35 years of their life uh, in, in a lighthouse, and they say, oh, Sam, when we have a tsunami, I can see it before. There's a tsunami shadow. So they were, you know, uh, told that after 35 years up there, you see things and you hear voices and whatnot. Um, but um, uh, David Walker in Hawaii managed to catch one on a video camcorder, and uh, his fellow, Oleg Godin, uh, showed that um, he could uh, estimate something which was due to turbulence at the surface, which would modify the index of refraction of the Earth. And he published this uh, in early 2005, uh, which means the paper had been submitted a year earlier, and I had the privilege to be a reviewer and trying to understand what he was saying was difficult enough. But, uh, and he verified it on the JSON altimeter records of 2009, you can actually catch a tsunami this way. So these people in the lighthouses, after all, uh, they were actually seeing the tsunami shadow. If you see the tsunami, can you hear it? And um, the, the story is interesting in Diego Garcia. There are many things in Diego Garcia, but they also they have uh, infrasound networks um, that, uh, that can be 
uh, beamed by, um, by uh, very sophisticated techniques to tell you where the sound is coming from. And they found that the sound from the tsunami was coming from this area of the Sumatra. Now, that's kind of interesting because uh, this, is, this is the epicentral area. It wasn't coming from Sumatra and the Andaman. It was coming from Burma or Myanmar, as it's known now. Um, that's kind of funny because Burma was a place where the, the tsunami was very weak, uh, only about 2.9 meters and, and only about 100 depths or so, as opposed to Thailand. So why? Well, maybe you should remember that a wave um, has a, a condition, I mean, it can break at the beach, okay? When we are breakers, people go surfing, they, they, the wave breaks at the beach. And when it breaks, it does two things. It doesn't penetrate very far inland. You can stay on the beach and look at the breakers, and then it makes noise. Uh -huh. And so uh, maybe uh, if you look at the, the continental shelf here, you have an enormous continental shelf uh, uh, here in front of Burma and a much narrower one in Thailand. And so probably the tsunami broke on the continental shelf here, uh, which meant it didn't have energy to propagate uh, to Myanmar, but, uh, but it, it, uh, it backscattered the, the infrasound all the way to Diego. So after all, yes, you can hear a tsunami. And finally, I want to say a few words that a tsunami can be detected in the geomagnetic field of the Earth. Um, before Sumatra, uh, there were some theoretical studies, among others by Tyler at the University of Washington, which predicted that uh, when you move a tsunami, you are moving a conductor. Remember, the, the uh, uh, salt water is, is a conductor. And so you're moving a conductor in the geomagnetic field of the Earth. So you're creating a current. That cr current creates a... Uh, a, a magnetic field, and so you should affect the magnetic field of the Earth. Unfortunately, and he has this formula which predicts, you know, the, the change in the magnetic field as, as a function of the amplitude of the tsunami. But uh, unfortunately, during Sumatra, it turns out that the areas with a maximum displacement uh, of, the, uh, of the wave were at the magnetic equator where you cannot observe this signal. Unfortunately, in the case of Chile, uh, this was detected in the case of Chile, and you see here that there is a strong signal uh, recorded at Easter Island at the time of the tsunami. And uh, even though this fellow Majoy, Manoj, uh, Manoj um, uh, said that he, he, was, uh, he couldn't match the amplitude, this is because he was comparing with the amplitude inside the harbor at Easter Island rather than the amplitude uh, on the high seas. And um, uh, this was uh, later on during Tohoku, there was also uh, a case like this. So as a conclusion, I hope I, I, I um, convinced you that the tsunami is certainly not limited uh, to the uh, ocean column. And uh, if it were limited to the ocean column, we would never generate anything. Because uh, the largest uh, source that we've had in the ocean column is Wigwam in 1955, which was um, a, uh, a nuclear test by the American Navy uh, inside the water column, 20 kT. And, and this is a picture of Wigwam. Um, but uh, we have coupling at the surface. At the surface, we have a factor of 1,000 in density. Now, that's a lot. Uh, but we are going from a fluid to a fluid. So it's all fluid mechanics, and it should be coupled, especially if you have a big source. And in the atmosphere, we do have big sources. We have Krakatau, which is 150 megatons. And um, we have uh, the largest nuclear test, which was a Russian test in Nova Zemlya, which was 57 megatons. Uh, but it was uh, far in the, in the Arctic, and the records um, have disappeared. And you have a second level of coupling, which is at the bottom of the ocean, uh, where uh, you go from something which has essentially zero rigidity to whatever rigidity the Earth has. And uh, in, the, in the solid Earth, the biggest uh, uh, source we have is the Chilean earthquake for the time being uh, at 1960. And the, the full understanding of many, many tsunami properties uh, mandates the modeling of these subtle coupling effects. And for these effects, the normal mode theory is, is wonderful. Um, but they, re they um, of course, require gigantic sources because this, this coupling is very small. So I've certainly run out of time by now. And so I'll stop there, and I'll take your questions if um, the chair allows them. Thank you very much.